boundary there. Um, after moving to California, uh, Dr. Jung later majored in psychology at uh, UC Berkeley and went on to earn his PhD um, at Northwestern University. Um, he's the author of several academic textbooks, including a second edition uh, in 2010 of Alcohol, Other Drugs, and Behavior. And we can invite him back for a talk on that. Um, he was a professor of psychology at California, California State University, Long Beach, for 40 years. Upon retiring, Dr. Jung created an entirely new career as he wrote four books on the history of Chinese immigrants and their family-run businesses. Two of these books focus on the South, um, Southern Fried Rice and uh, chopsticks, chopsticks in the Land of Cotton. He's also written Chinese Laundries and Sweet and Sour, The Life in Chinese Family Restaurants. Um, he's been making presentations about these, uh, these books and the experiences of the people he's writing about to pay tribute um, to these pioneers. So following ta the talk, there gonna, there's going to be plenty of time for questions, uh, an questions and answers and discussion. And Dr. John has also brought copies of his books, if you are interested um, in, in them. Um, and so before we get started, uh, I just want to thank you once again for being here. And we're looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, being a native-born southerner, I guess it's always good to come visit the South, even though I don't come from this neck of the woods, but I can identify with a lot of things Southern. Even though I've spent most of my life out of the South, you can't completely take the South out of me, I guess. You know, it's an early experience phenomenon. And I do have to say that uh, much as I enjoyed psychology and being a professor, if I had known how valuable and rewarding it was to get into looking at my roots as a Chinese American, I think I would have retired sooner. Um, <laughs> so, um, let me see if I can get this work the way I want to work. Um, okay, so as was pointed out, um, my family um, was the only Chinese family in our whole town. So there's me and my <laughs> surrounded by people uh, that we were not quite like. Now, um, some of you um, will know China pretty well, others may not. The point I want to make is Guangdong, which is uh, right above Hong Kong, the little yellow uh, province there, that is where uh, most of the early Chinese came from. And I want to make sure you understand that because um, Understanding Chinese America today is much more complicated because we have Chinese coming from Taiwan, from mainland, all other parts of China. And while there's a lot of similarities, there are also many differences among those Chinese from Guangdong and other places. One of the most important things you need to know, aside from the fact that they spoke Cantonese and other dialects as opposed to Mandarin, is that the Cantonese Chinese, when they came, were very poor. And you know, for the most part, not highly educated. And that's quite different from many of the later immigrants from China, say, after 1965, when the immigration laws were uh, liberalized. This is uh, something that I guess your population studies people have also been, I didn't come to 2010, but just to give you uh, an idea of how few Chinese there were in the American South, uh, I looked at the uh, 1920 and 1930 census figures. That prior to that, the numbers were so small that they wouldn't even show up on this graph. You can see that Mississippi had the most. You can also notice that they were mostly men. Uh, there were very few women. Uh, so these were bachelor societies for the most part. Some of these men had wives, even had families in China that they left behind for a variety of reasons. Uh, many of these bachelor men did, in fact, eventually go back to China, get married, uh, and arrange marriages, and then bring their wives over and have families in, in the United States. Um, now, um, I uh, looked during lunch, or right at lunch, I was in square, uh, you know, the town square, and I looked in the bookstore, and I noticed that one of the prominent historians of the American South, James Cobb, has a new book out. I don't remember the exact title, but something like The South After, I don't know whether it was after World War II or whether it was after 1960, but you know, 
um, within certainly the last generation. And I'm a speed reader, but I have time reading whole books. So I looked in the index under Chinese. Zero, nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, Hispanics, seven pages. Everything else, black and white. So then I saw also there was a copy of a book I had read before, uh, The Place Most Southern or something that James Codman uh, published maybe in the early 1990s. I looked in that index, Chinese, seven pages. Okay, so between 1992 and 2011, Chinese got seven pages of attention, down to zero pages of, of attention, which is kind of surprising in a way, because actually there are more Chinese in the South now than there were 20, 30 years ago. Uh, when I go to Atlanta, I'm overwhelmed by how I many Asians of, of various countries, um, Vietnam, Korea, um, Thailand, and of course China. So I think this partly attests to the fact that um, Chinese are such a small minority in many parts of the South that no one really even notices them for the most part or records them in documentation. Um, some of you may know that in 1882, the United States passed a law, the only law that's ever been passed in the United States, which prohibited or excluded members of one particular ethnic group or one particular nation. The Chinese. Uh, it's also important to note that the law actually was prohibiting laborers from coming in. Actually, if you were a Chinese diplomat, or you were a student, or you were a merchant, you could get in. Merchants were still valued, even though you know many uh, white Americans did not uh, fully welcome Chinese because there was an economic benefit generate you know, uh, business and income and trade. But laborers, especially around 1870 and subsequently, uh, were sort of competition with white labor in times of economic adversity. You know, it's sort of like a deja vu in a way of what we're having now, that you know, times are hard and part of the sentiment against immigration is that we don't want other people coming in and taking away our jobs. Chinese were not like for many other reasons, not the least of which is their appearance was different, their dress was different, their food was different, uh, their language was different, and so forth. So uh, you can see just within this uh, poster that it was very uh, significant the way uh, rallies were held and political protests uh, that led eventually to the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And those Chinese who were here prior to 1882, there was a move to get rid of them. Uh, maybe they couldn't actually deport them, but many of the Chinese were on the West Coast, which makes sense because that's, you know, close to the end of the country. Uh, there were many violent uh, episodes in the West uh, where Chinese were literally driven out at sundown. Uh, case in point, Eureka, California, Tacoma. Even in Los Angeles, there were riots against the Chinese. Even as far, even, I guess you want to call it as Rock Spring, Miami, uh, there was physical violence toward Chinese. Their stores were burned down. Uh, their living areas were destroyed. And in some sense, I think that may have contributed to a faster move of the Chinese into the inner part of the country. It's almost like instead of safety in numbers, it was like safety being isolated because um, if you have a community of Chinese, you have a nice more opposition. If you were the only Chinese in town, then you weren't perceived as a great threat because obviously you weren't taking away that many jobs. Um, I got interested in this from a personal perspective. Um, but after my mother passed away, um, my mother time and maybe even now was crap. She was recycling long before recycling came in both. Um, I have now all kinds of tales about things that she saved. But she did save her past from coming to from China in 1928. This opened up a lot of doors of documentation for me from the National Archives in San Francisco. 
tells all the interrogation uh, records, transcripts of the immigrants who, whether they came from China or wherever, all the ones who came in through the West Coast are in house there, some in Seattle, some uh, below San, uh, San Diego down, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, not as far as San Diego, but in the Miguel. And I was particularly interested in this because even though I knew from verbal reports my mother, uh, what experience I had um, as a child, I didn't always believe everything she told me. Uh, partly that was a child, and there was a certain amount of rebellion anyway. Also, I knew my mother was kind of uh, educated and superstitious, so I didn't always fully believe everything she told me. She told me about exclusion. She told me about the fact that um, being Chinese, um, bought papers and documents from other people and had to change their names. And so I learned at an early age that my American name, John, was not really my real name. So it would be among Chinese. Other Chinese would, the common thing they would ask you is, which translates to like, what clan do you come from? Or like, what, what is your family name? And my parents would always tell them, say, Lao. he could get into the country. So that um, was kind of a scary thing in a way. Um, on the one hand, why are my parents lying? You know, uh, why are they doing this? And my mother would say, well, there are these unjust laws, there are these unfair practices, and we have to do this so that we can get into the country. Why do we need to get into the country? Because in China and whatnot at the time, um, the, it was extremely difficult living circumstances. Drought one year, famine, uh, floods the next year, warlords fighting and so forth. So the young and not so young Chinese men left China, went to all parts of the world actually, not just the United States and Canada, but also as far as Australia, New Zealand, and so forth, to try to earn a better living. So that's why they were desperate to buy papers from other people. And so they became known as paper sons. And I, I was able to access some of the records of my family through this document because that helped the archives locate the files. There's just a couple of uh, photos of my parents when they first came over. Uh, this is a small excerpt, and I don't know how you read it. I'll, I'll walk you through it, just maybe the yellow part. I found 75 to 100 pages, single space, type transcript, verbatim transcript of the interrogation that my father uh, experienced when he tried to come back in the country in 1928. This was his second time. In other words, he came in 1921 as a single man. He went to, jo to Georgia. Uh, and then uh, after he earned some money, he went back to China in an arranged marriage married my mother, came back to Georgia. And that's the short story. All right, so he comes in, and the immigration authorities know that many Chinese, a very large number, are using false papers. So what they want to do is to show that you are not the person you say you are, and then deport you or not admit you. Um, paper sons come about in a number of ways. I don't want to take the time to go into detail, but like one example might be, uh, a merchant might go back to China for a period. And when he comes back, he follows a report and says um, he's, he had, uh, he's given birth, his, mother, his wife has given birth to a son. Write that down. Okay, maybe 10 years later or 12 years later. Um, that son didn't really exist, by the way. It, it's just a fictitious entry, you know, that I have a son, but I don't. They don't actually go and check to see if you have a son. All right, now I can sell that paper to someone who does, a laborer who has a son that wants to come to the United States. Now, that's the easy part. The hard part is to memorize all the details about the village, the, the family relationships, and so forth, of the alleged name. So my father had to know all these things, and so they asked him all these questions. 
And you can see in the middle, you were asked the same, oh, he, he said, uh, he changed his mind on his answer. And he said, you know, you're acting just the way you did seven years ago, because we went and looked at your transcript, okay? And uh, they, they challenged him. They said, you first stated they will all dwell as you change your mind. Are you memorizing your story you lie, or are you stating facts? Uh, when I read that, you know, my, my, my chills ran up down my spine because I'm thinking, boy, if I was there in real time, I would think that they're probably going to, you know, reject him. Because the same kind of thing came up two or three times, and every single time, my father basically said, I'm just telling you the truth. And my father was a fairly calm, nonchalant person, and I tend to think, that maybe the fact that he never backed down, he never then said, oh, well, in that case, you know, blah, 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 that he stood his ground, that maybe that's what got him through, because they don't actually go back and look to see, you know, where your house is in the village. Okay, so um, that's part of this paper sun business. Uh, in Macon, we had a, this laundry, and it's called Samley Laundry, which is a very common name for Chinese laundries. And, <coughs> By the way, it, it does not mean that some man named Sam Lee owned the laundry. There were not any people named, actually named Sam Lee, although a lot of our customers thought my father's name was Sam Lee. Sam Lee is just sort of a uh, romanization of uh, three prophets or something like that. Or, uh, Chinese had wishful thinking. They named a lot of their laundries like Forever Victorious, uh, many prophets, you know. And it was almost like if we name our laundry with a high sounding term, I guess it's the same that if you name your race horse with some really valiant uh, name that it'll, it'll be, you know, good. So that was our laundry. We lived above the laundry, which is probably the hottest place in town in the summer because heat rises. Um, now, after I started doing this research, I, I looked in some archives and I found a, an archive called Vanishing Georgia. And it, it gave a, um, a record that showed the hotel that was right next to our laundry called the Lanier Hotel. So I went and looked it up. And it's 1906. And lo and behold, there was the Lanier Hotel. But I didn't recognize it because it, they had torn down those uh, balconies in front of it by the time I grew up. But once I spotted those windows that I sort of uh, uh, put a square around uh, in red, I knew that that was the very same building. And what's kind of interesting is that um, I had an archivist to make it look up um, who had been at that address in, like in earlier years. Uh, because when I was living there, I didn't know and I didn't even care or think to ask uh, what business had been at this address before my father had a laundry there in the 1920s. Well, as a matter of fact, what happened was there was a laundry at that very building with the same name, Sam Lee Laundry, as early as like 1885. So some Chinese guy had a laundry there, then probably retired, died or whatever, went back to China, sold the laundry to another Chinese person, and it just maintained itself as family laundry. So that was really kind of a personal discovery that, hey, you know, there have been Chinese people here a long time ago before I was there. It turns out that this archivist, I, I later found out because I went down there a couple years later, his father went to junior high school with me. <laughs> so a small world kind of phenomenon, um, as a side note. Uh, so then I went back in 2005, and uh, there again is like where we live in the laundry. And here um, is what, where the laundry was. I'm standing right in front of where the laundry was. You can see it's now a parking lot in 2005. And while I didn't expect them to preserve the building and put a plaque on it or anything, nonetheless, I was a little distressed, even though I didn't really have, um, I think that our building was that great. You know, nonetheless, I have to say, I won't say I was angry, but I was, I said to myself, in effect, you know, this is like new and every year. And I think that partly motivated me, uh, gave me an extra incentive to, to write Southern Fried Rice, because I said, you know, uh, 100 years from now, and someone wonders, were there any Chinese in Macon, Georgia? And they'll say, no, there's no record of it. Okay, I'm going to give you a record of at least one family that was there. And so um, I, didn't, I didn't give up just because of that. <laughs> it was a shock. So I learned um, also that in, in Georgia, in some parts of Tennessee, like um, Chattanooga, parts of Alabama, 
there were these Chinese laundries. Not only were there these Chinese laundries, uh, there were virtually no other Chinese businesses. Maybe there was one or two restaurants. Um, and this is as, even as late as 19, maybe 40s and so forth. And furthermore, all of the laundries that I've identified here were somehow related to my father. They were either second cousins, uh, uncles, brothers, uh, cousins, or something like that. So all these people got there through a chain of migration where uh, one person comes over, gets settled, sends word back to the village to send a younger brother over, uh, which was true in the case of my father. His younger brother came over, uh, stayed with my father for a couple of years, learned the ropes, saved some money, went to Atlanta and opened a laundry. And that's how it worked. Interestingly, my uncle, the one I'm referring to, he actually flunked the immigration test. He, he, didn't, he couldn't pass the immigration test. They, they, they were going to deport him. But somehow, and I don't know exactly how well he bribed them or what, but he got it. They, they said, basically, you're denied admission. Do you wish um, to have a, um, uh, well, it wasn't reconsideration, but what, you know, like a second hearing. He said, yeah, you know, my, my lawyer said, yeah. And then the next thing in the file says, admit it, land him. And we don't know exactly how he got in, but he did get in. Uh, just a few personal photos of my mother and us growing up in, in Macon. Um, and my father taking a break maybe uh, inside the store, outside the store. Uh, because hours were pretty long for all those people, not just for my parents. They worked from sunrise to sunset uh, at least six days of the week, sometimes six and a half days of the week, Sunday off. So in that sense, Chinese laundry went at a re relatively easy because we only had to work six days. Chinese restaurant people usually work seven days. So you know, we often debated who had the rougher life. So um, here's something that you don't need to be told. Uh, like if I give this talk in the north, um, I, I need to include things like this. So I didn't delete it. But so I was telling them like in the days of Jim Crow laws. Know, what would happen. Um, you know, when I first gave this talk, like in New York, I wasn't really sure how well it would be received in the sense that, and I talked about it in Atlanta, mostly to older Chinese. They ate it up. They just loved it. I mean, they were uh, really complimenting me on this and that and other, and I felt really good. But then I stopped and asked myself, why are they so happy about me doing this? I have not told them anything that they don't already know. And then I thought about it and said, well, it must be because they're happy that someone's telling a story, because my story was not all that different from their story. OK, fine. Now I go to New York. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't know how they're going to relate to this. I better explain to them what the South is like. And they like it, and they are all interested. But for them, the interest was sort of quasi-anthropological. See, they couldn't, they couldn't believe there were Chinese in the South, or that they could even live down there. I mean, when I was a teenager, everywhere I would go, wherever someone found out that I was from the South, the first thing they would say, where's your Southern accent? We don't believe you. So then I give them a simple Southern accent. <laughs> and then they say, okay, how come y'all in the South? They know Chinese in the South, right? So, so then I have to explain to them, well, my father went to the South because he had a relative who, who brought him there, you know, and that's how he got there. It wasn't like it, it was his planned destination. So. I explained to them, like, for example, and the term in those days was not African American, so I'm not going to use it then. So when we were growing up there, if you were a colored person, you could not eat in a white restaurant or sit. In, you could buy the food at the takeout window and take it home or go outside in the park and eat it. You could not go inside and sit with white people. Uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, who needs no explanation, uh, was playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers, and uh, they'd have spring training in Florida, and then they would proceed north. They came to Macon once, and there was going to be an exhibition game against our local Sally Lee Class A minor league baseball team, the Macon Peaches. How's that for a name for you know athletic team? Okay, <laughs> citizens arose and said, "This shall not pass. There will be no athletic contest where there is a mixture of races." So they canceled games, so I never got to see Jagger Robinson. OK, so the question is, what about these Chinese people in, in, in Georgia, at least, first? Um, one example, I 
vividly remember. I, I don't know how old that was, maybe four, maybe three, I don't know. I was in the dime store, and it was a hot summer day, and I went to the drinking fountains. And as you know, there were two drinking fountains there, white and colored. And I had a 50-50 chance of getting the, the correct one, whichever the correct one might be. Um, so, on one occasion, I'm sure, I must have started drinking out of the colored fountain. I felt someone tap me on the shoulder. I turned around and looked up, and there was a, a white lady, and she didn't say anything, but she kind of nudged me over and, you know, told me to drink from the other fountain. I couldn't read then, you know, but any time I went there, I always went for the one that she told me to go to, because that was, you know, what I was being told. So, um, that was one thing that, for that purpose, I was white. Okay? I was not colored, or I, I could drink from the white fountain. Um, on another occasion, I was playing with my black friend, uh, who his mother worked up the street from the laundry, so there weren't many kids in our neighborhood because we lived kind of in the downtown area. And one day my father called me over and he said, uh, one of the customers told me that I should tell you that you should not play with this black boy anymore. And that, that was nothing else told, like why or why not, but they just said, you know, advice, you know, tell your son not to do this. Um, I basically ignored the advice, and my father never, you know, said anything subsequently. But, you know, I, re I just remember it very vividly because it seemed like, why is someone meddling with what I'm doing? Uh, we, didn't, we didn't think we were doing anything wrong, we were just kids playing, you know. So, those were a couple of examples. Um, that stand up, you know, in a child's mind. Um, we could go to the public facilities where the whites were, um, movie theaters or picture shows, um, fine. Restaurants, we really didn't know for sure. We're pretty sure we could go on a white restaurant. The reason I say that is we were poor. My mother cooked all the meals, so we never actually went to a restaurant, so we never got thrown out of a restaurant. Um, I had a bicycle, and the town wasn't that big, so I actually never took the bus, so I don't know where they would have let me sit on the bus, so that wasn't a problem. The main thing is, because we were the only Chinese in our town, we were treated as individuals, so they didn't really have a generalization about Chinese, so maybe if there had been 50 of us there, that might have been more of a problem. That's just sort of conjectural. All right, and, and I went to the white school, which uh, we, the thought never came up whether we'd have a problem. We did well in school, and the teachers liked us, and so forth. But uh, the archivist uh, found some information that was kind of interesting to me as I was writing Southern Fried Rice. This is a newspaper article, look in the Macon newspaper in the like probably 1910 thereabouts, um, where the journalist is trying to convey to the population of readers what these Chinese people are like. So you can see these Chinese are a little different. They eat curious edibles. Eatable, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but uh, the Chinese do these kind of different things. And so, in a sense, they're trying to be uh, informative, you know, educate people. But there's a sort of a, a tongue in cheek uh, sort of poking fun at the Chinese. So, for example, um, the Chinese eat these strange things, you know, um, think curious little things to make chop suey, uh, ducks' feet, birds' nests, um, lychee nuts, things that, you know, people in Georgia you would have never heard of. Um, so um, when Sam Lee, uh, prior to the laundry, was asked on what Chinese got drunk, meaning what brand of intoxicant the Celestials used, uh, Celestials was a very common term to use in those days to refer to Chinese because the Chinese came from the uh, Celestial you know, kingdom or whatever. Uh, he gravely uh, replied, um, on oh, New Year's Day, and then they're sort of saying, oh, he misunderstood, you know, and we're not going to argue with him. So anyway, that was the kind of thing. I, I wasn't exposed to that, so so that wasn't part of my growing up as Chinese. We would tease sometimes, you know, the Ching Chong Chinaman, the slamming eye kind of thing. Oh, can you say something in Chinese, you know, or people would come up and mock Chinese, you know, they'd come and make up some Chinese sounds. But other than that, like, you know, we were not terribly abused, but we did feel isolated. Uh, here's an example, also my archive is found for me, that before I was there, like in 1910, there was actually a Chinese girl who was denied admission to the white school 
the cause that she was considered an alien and that uh, only Caucasians could you know, go to the white school. Now, there were some good things about not having mass media in those days because mass media were not too favorable for Chinese. Uh, I was fortunate, for example, I never even heard of Fu Manchu uh, when I was a kid. I mean, not that you know, he didn't exist, but uh, there was this series of comic books, action figures, they were sort of like the Magnificent Seven, it was called Black Hawk. And these were sort of like vigilantes who fought for justice all around the world and fought evildoers and whatever. And there was a Chinese member of the Black Hawks. He did not have a blue uniform and a pistol and his own plane to fly. He rode in the back cockpit behind the, the leader, Black Hawks, in his plane. And when he had to go out and fight the evildoers, he didn't have a gun, he had a meat cleaver. So, um, you know, when I would look at this, it's, I'm sure I don't remember exactly how I felt. I didn't feel particularly good about it, you know. I probably would have been happier if they didn't have a Chinese character in there because it was sort of derogatory in that sense, even though he was considered one of the good guys. And um, he would be portrayed uh, in somewhat uh, like as a buffoon for, for humor and that kind of thing. So those, those were like my only images of Chinese in media. I didn't even know about Charlie Chan, you know, who you can debate about whether that was a positive image or not, but I didn't even know about that because uh, I grew up with more TV uh, and I didn't go to the movies all that much. And when I did go to the movies, I mainly wanted to go see Cowboys. Um, now, what was important to me in terms of my identity as Chinese because see, even though I learned to speak Chinese as my first language, because my parents didn't know English, and even though everything around me told me I was Chinese, my parents told me I was Chinese, they even said, oh, when we retire, we're going to go back to China. And then we kids would say, well, we're not going. You're going to have to go by yourself. We're staying here. We're Americans. You know, uh, We didn't know the difference. Um, so there were no other Chinese people could relate to. But my uncle, who I referred to before, had this laundry that is in this picture, which actually still stands in Atlanta near the football stadium. He and a few other Chinese bachelor men, probably no more than 10 or 15, had laundries. They all had laundries uh, in Atlanta. And once in a while, maybe every few months, my father would take me on the train. It was a two-hour ride on Sunday, and just one day off. We would go and visit these laundrymen. We would go to one person's laundry, maybe several other laundry men would come. And in hindsight, it must have been extremely boring for me, but I was kind of a sort of a patient kid. And I would just sit there and twiddle my thumbs and wait until it was time to go home to get back on the train. And the joy of, of going to Atlanta was not the train ride, because train ride was not good for me, because I would always get sick on the train. As soon as we get to the train station in Atlanta and get out, I'd throw up. And then we'd go to see my uncle, and then we'd go home. So, but nonetheless, being there sort of helped me form some sort of conception of what it was to be Chinese. I mean, well, it wasn't necessarily a good conception, but it was just the way I, you know, all Chinese I knew ran laundries. Uh, I listened to these men talk about the old days or talk about the village or people that they knew in other parts of the United States. And so I kind of absorbed a lot of it by osmosis, uh, that there was this sort of nostalgia, this sort of loneliness. Um, and this sort of isolation, that because they didn't socialize with you know uh, anyone else, they didn't socialize with white people or black people, and even if they ran a business, it was just mainly a, a business transaction. There, there really weren't you know social uh, activities for them to be involved with. So what I did learn from my mother mainly, because uh, I don't know if this is true of all families, but just speaking of my own, my father never really talked to me about a lot of these things, and maybe I never really asked him. Or maybe my mother satisfied my curiosity enough. But my mother made sure that we knew about where Chinese stood. So we, she wanted us to be extra careful not to get in trouble. So um, consequently, it was sort of like a self-defeating prophecy because all the bad things that she said were going to happen actually never happened to us because we were very careful. So, you know, um, which, you know, I guess you could say she did what she felt was necessary and was important. But at the same time, it, it creates some negativism in my own identity as Chinese. You know, it's sort of like, do I want to be Chinese? Is it good to be Chinese? You know, exactly what is it, you know, that's, that's Chinese? And I never really understood, you know, as a child, why we were there in the South. 
Um, and see, because of limited uh, education and, uh, and media, I didn't even know there were things like Chinatown. I didn't know there was things like Chinese New Year. Uh, I didn't know a lot about Chinese customs. I knew I was Chinese, but you know, I really didn't know what it fully meant. Uh, my mother told us all about paper sign, and that, that left a really bitter feeling uh, for her, and it, it carried over to me, and, and a lot of negative feelings about how we were treated. Uh, and my mother particularly said, well, you know, you're outnumbered. You're the only ones here. You're not going to get any fights or arguments, you know. If, if people confront you, you know, you just get out of the situation and avoid it. So probably a lot of Chinese tended to do that. I mean, we didn't have the numbers to go and, and protest or, 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 you know, fight some un unfair situation. Uh, my mother and father did tell us a lot about China and, and positive things about China. So in that sense, that was good. That helped us feel, uh, even though we didn't feel we were Chinese from China, nonetheless, because our parents were from China, we understood that China had this civilization, and uh, my parents used to bring out this big map, and I'd look at it, and they'd show us where they used to live, and this, that sort of thing. So that was a very, very important kind of thing for a child to learn, I think. So uh, what about any positive things about China? We actually got written up in a newspaper article Big day for us, okay? That's me on the far this side or whatever. You left or whatever. Anyway, um, Madam Chiang Kai shek, who uh, at that time was uh, Chiang Kai shek's wife and one of the most powerful women in the United States, uh, I mean, in the world, she came to the United States in 1943 to rally support in America for fighting the war against the Japanese. And she came to Macon to get an honorary uh, doctorate. And uh, unknown to a lot of people is she spent like her early teen years in Macon, Georgia. And um, so that was one of the reasons that she came back. And um, this is the, by the way, the other half of that article when I showed you the girl was um, alien, you know, was excluded from a Chinese, uh, from Russian school. Uh, it was Mrs. Schoon. They didn't spell her name right. Mrs. Schoon, uh, they call it Schoon, but it's S O O N G, Mei Ling Schoon. That was Madame Shankashek's maiden name. So this is talking about how in 1910 or 11, Madame Chiang had, uh, Macon, Georgia has the distinction of being the place that rejected Madame Chiang from going to school. So anyway, finally at some point, my parents decided uh, as we were teenagers and growing up, my older sister was, you know, dating age and everything, that um, they wanted us to go live where there were Chinese people. Uh, so we could mingle with Chinese people and so forth. So they just uh, said, we're moving, you know. And that was a rude, rude shock. Uh, I, I, didn't, I wasn't really ready to move, I mean, but, you know, I said, we're moving. So uh, my father stayed behind several years, and we all got up and left, and left my father behind to work and to support us. And then finally, when he decided to leave, they sort of wrote this nice little uh, article, so like, goodbye, you know, it's been nice to know you, thanks for being a good citizen of the community. And when I read this article, I had to, I can't, I can't uh, say that I completely understood it. I started laughing a little bit because there were so many mistruths in it. So, for example, the one at the bottom about my parents being devout followers of Confucius, which was absolutely not true. My fathers were very a-religious, uh, you know, just totally uninterested in religion. Uh, they weren't Buddhists, they weren't Confucius, or anything. they were just hard-working people. And so, one day, when I was a small child, I heard the church bells ringing on the block behind us, and I asked my parents, what, what, what's that noise? Oh, well, that's the church. Those bells are calling people, it's time to go to church. Well, why aren't we going to church? So, well, the church is for white people because during the week, they do a lot of bad things. <laughs> Sunday, they need to go pray and get forgiveness. We're Chinese, so we don't need to know. So, I was explaining it because I was only four or five, plus I didn't want to go to church, I was having a good time at home. <laughs> that my father saved up money in the middle to go back to Canton and marry his childhood, childhood sweetheart. His father did not have a childhood sweetheart. He was there in Macon, Georgia by himself working away, and, and then someone sent him a letter and said, hey, we found this match for you, come back over here and get married. So it wasn't his childhood sweetheart, so that was total fiction. Um, the top part about him referring to his father um, uh, being in the United States where he was, well, that was not true. And 
my grandfather or his father never came to the United States. So then the question came to me, how did these mistruths get represented here? And knowing my father, I think when they interviewed him, he was given leading questions. Oh, you went back to China. Oh, you went to marry your sweetheart. Yeah. My, you know, my father wasn't going to explain to him how he just figured that this is what he wants, this is what I'm going to say. I'm just going to nod my head and get the interview over with. The fact about him having a father who came over, I finally figured it out was that my father remembered that 30 years earlier, he had told them that he had a father here because it was his paper father. He could not now say, no, my father never came here because that would contradict his entry into the United States in 1921. So in the back of his mind, you know, he still remembered that he had told the authorities that he had a father here, and his father was a merchant, his father was living here. So um, that was kind of an interesting discovery that was um, valuable to me. Uh, now, I want to talk a little, just a little bit um, more about selling fried rice, but let me just make a couple points here. Uh, okay. Um, I didn't really completely, and I even, even maybe now I don't really understand all this stuff about, you know, being a ch Chinese and uh, what it really means, but um, my identity has fluctuated as a Chinese back and forth from sideways in different directions depending on context and where I've been and who I'm around. Um, it, I'm always Chinese in one sense, but the saliency of it to me varies. Like if I'm around a bunch of Chinese, then suddenly I feel very Chinese, you know, and I can even speak some Chinese, and I can even understand some Chinese, and I think Chinese. But then if I'm in a context like in academia in the early years where I was not around many Chinese, I mean in psychology, no one in Chinese in psychology, maybe in engineering and math, uh, then I, I'm suddenly not Chinese. You know, I, then I'm more Caucasian, I'm more academic, you know, because I, I'm in that world, I'm in that universe. I mean, you could call it schizophrenic or something. But, you know, I could, I could code switch. You know, okay, you want me to speak good English? Okay, I'll speak good English. You want me to speak Chinese ghetto English? I can do that too. Uh, after I went to San Francisco, I learned how those Chinese butchered the English. You know, I started doing it too. Because you kind of want to fit in, you know. It, it's almost like you don't think about it. So, uh, but I have to say that uh, there were many times growing up that I didn't really feel eager to be Chinese or associated with Chinese because um, the, I was the mirror of society was telling me that uh, we were second class. And uh, certainly that was incorporated to, into myself at various times. So I would try to avoid even thinking about being Chinese. And there'd be periods in my life where maybe when I hadn't been around Chinese people for a long time, me, I'd walk down the hall, I'd look in the mirror, and I'd say, hell, there's a Chinese person there. Oh, it's me. <laughs> I'd suddenly remember, I'm Chinese, you know, this sort of thing. And also, you know, people would come up to me, like, I'm the authority. They perceive me as the authority. And they say, oh, we need to know something about Chinese. Let's go ask John Jung. He ought to know. He's Chinese, right? Um, and, and so, on the one hand, you know, we're not fully respected, but on the other hand, we're assumed to know everything about Chinese culture, so that's kind of a burden. Um, and since I started writing these, these stories and also giving talks, even though the majority of my audiences are probably Chinese Americans, I have given talks to audiences that were predominantly not Chinese, and um, I found like it helps other people understand uh, what the Chinese situation was like, uh, so in that sense, it's, it's really kind of rewarding, and, and it, it helps me understand their situation. That um, Chinese were not unique with their problems. Uh, I remember giving one talk, an African American woman came up to me and said to me, "Thank you so much for your talk. I could really relate to that." And you know, I thought to myself first, like, "What is she saying?" You know, and I, she must have looked at me and saw that I was kind of quizzical, and she immediately said. I grew up in New Hampshire, and our family, we were the only black people in our town. So right away, I knew that uh, what my story was was not just about Chinese. It was about people who were isolated in terms of their cultural um, communities. And that's the common uh, denominator that she and I had with regard to this. And um, I've been fortunate. I've gotten feedback from other people. 
other different people have different parts of the book of the story that they like that they relate to, and that that's quite understandable. Um, I, this is probably my most exciting email that I ever got about my book, <laughs> and so I have to share it with you. There was this guy sent me an email. At first, I thought he was accusing me of something. It was basically something like, "You've stolen my story." And I thought, "Well, what is this?" And the guy's name was almost like mine. It was James Jung, and his family had run a Chinese laundry in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Uh, they were the only Chinese in Kannapolis, uh, North Carolina. At the bottom part, he writes a letter, email to his four brothers who also grew up there, and he says, "You know." My God, this is the same. It's the same three windows looking down the street below. You know, he was incredulous. So that was a, a, it was kind of a real enjoyable uh, experience. I mean, I, I felt like you know, yeah, you know, I think I'm telling my own story. I'm actually telling the story of a lot of other people like that. And when I did one of my, my research for a, another book, I, for example, I looked over the state of Iowa, like 1910 or 1900, and I found like uh, every other county had like maybe one Chinese in them. They were all running laundries, maybe one or two were running restaurants. These people were all isolated too, but they, none of them told their story, okay? So my story is not as, um, well, unique is not maybe the right word, but it, it, is, it represents the experience of uh, quite a few other Chinese of my generation. Now, uh, let me talk about the uh, Delta itself, okay? Again, this map you don't need to know, but if I'm in Chicago, I need to show this. So. Uh, after the end of slavery, uh, the cotton plantations uh, were desperate to go and find cheap labor. And uh, here you can see there was actually a newspaper article, among others, and a cartoon sort of saying, you know, how are we going to solve this problem that we're not going to have you know, enough uh, labor for the cotton fields? Well, we've got these Chinese we're trying to get rid of them anyway. So you know, if we can't kick them back to China, why don't we ship them down or recruit them down to the Delta and get them to work? And uh, so there was some movement toward that, but not very successful and not that many. And some of the ones who came apparently did not stay in it very long because the Chinese found other things that were more to their liking and you know, maybe uh, more profitable. So as we all know, cotton was you know, the, the driving force in the economy of the South in you know, the late 1800s. But at some point, uh, you know, bull we weevil and other factors, you know, decimated the cotton uh, economy. And the South, you can see particularly Mississippi by all those dots, was particularly hard hit because of the huge concentration of cotton plantations. Now, in those days when the uh, plantations were, were dominant, they also controlled all the resources in terms of like food and supplies. So, there would be like a company store, the commissary, and one example on the left uh, in Sunflower, Mississippi, and the picture of the interior. And so they had a, basically a monopoly, and they could charge whatever they wanted to for the, the goods and, and the food, the, the work equipment, and clothing, and so forth. But when the commissaries, uh, when plantations went downhill, a lot of them closed the commissaries. And that opened a window of opportunity for the Chinese so the Chinese, instead of going out in the fields and work, uh, some of them started opening small mom and pop grocery stores, family-run grocery stores. And again, this is a picture that I don't need to show you about like the southern uh, division of the black part of town and the white part of town, but again, it's kind of instructive for people up in other parts of the country. And here are just three shots of families and the interiors, uh, a small sample of the grocery stores that we're talking about. What was interesting to me, uh, oh, well, let me back up one second. How did I even get interested in this? Because I had actually never been to the Delta when I started this, unlike uh, writing some of the fried rice, which is a personal experience. I had given a talk at the Chinese Historical Society in Los Angeles about some fried rice. And at the end, the guy raised his hand. He was quite excited. He says, uh, I really enjoyed the talk. I, read, I, I just found it today. I came down. He said, I'm from Mississippi. And he said, do you know anything about the Mississippi Chinese? So I confessed to him. I said I knew a little bit, and I knew me and met one one Chinese person from there. So he said, "We really need someone to write uh, this kind of book about the Mississippi Chinese." And you know, why don't you do it? So I'm thinking to myself, well, hmm, "You're from Mississippi. Why don't you do it?" You know. <laughs> so I said, "Well, you know, I don't know." 
no. I mean, I said, well, let me think about it. You know, I've learned never to say absolutely no, you know, kind of hedge a little bit. So I went, and so he gave me a name of a lot of people that he knew, relatives of people who were in the Delta. So I interviewed some of these people. I called some of them, and I found some archival uh, oral histories and so forth. And after maybe a couple of months, I read all this stuff, and I said, yeah, you know, this is really interesting, you know. This is a, a different kind of Chinese environment. When all of these people ran grocery stores. Now, in Augusta, Georgia, there were a lot of Chinese grocery stores, but like in Atlanta, there were none. In Macon, there was none. And so I didn't really have much knowledge about it. So I had to go and find some people who grew up in Chinese grocery stores and enlist their aid and, you know, give me personal experiences about like, what is it like to run a grocery store on a day in, day out basis? What are the chores? What are the duties? You know, uh, what's involved? You know, and so with that sort of collaborate cooperation, um, I was able to put this together and try to put, portray a, a picture of what, what life was like for these immigrants. Because uh, I was startled. Uh, well, startled is too strong word. Uh, surprised when I looked in Mississippi, I could not find a single Chinese laundry. And everywhere all over the country, there were Chinese laundries in virtually every state. Why is it that Mississippi has no Chinese laundry? I, it just puzzled me. You know, I don't know if I know all the answers. Maybe the grocery stores are more lucrative and, and better, but then once they got into the grocery stores, then they bring their relatives over, and the other relatives run, run, run grocery stores. And also, I kind of thought, well, if you don't have much money, what are you going to do? Get clean clothes or get food to eat? So I figured they'd probably get food to eat first, okay? So maybe that's why grocery stores were more lucrative. But anyway, uh, I found it fascinating uh, because I could relate to these Chinese people because they, they came from the same villages that my parents came from, the same parts of China. We kind of more or less spoke the same dialect. We compared notes and our, our upbringing was very similar and so forth, but even though our lifestyles were very different. And what was surprising to me was, even though these Chinese were spread all around the Delta, in a way they were isolated because there was just a handful of this town, a handful of that town, a handful of this town. Yeah, on the other hand, even without you know the internet and all of that, they were all interconnected. They all seemed to know everybody. A lot of them were relatives of each other, so it was a, it was a community that had strong ties. But yet they were spread out geographically. Uh, they were quite frugal. You can see that like, in, they would have uh, gatherings in stores because they didn't have another place. So after they closed, they moved some of the merchandise out of the way, throw together a makeshift table, eat dinner, or have a birthday party or whatever. And so they had large families, they had large uh, you know, interconnectedness. Now, this is a little too complicated to go into detail, but what it uh, sort of illustrates is the chain of migration that some people would come in, They'd open a store. Once it got going, uh, they'd expand. They'd go get relatives to come over from either China or other parts of the United States. Now, this particular one, I'm going to go in detail a little bit more because it deals with um, a family that actually ran a laundry in Massachusetts and decided to come to the Delta. And then, once they got established, they brought in other people. Okay, so uh, and then next generation. So, so this is just skimming the surface. But what I wanted to show was that the Chinese didn't just all in the Delta just didn't go directly there. They, they did other things first. They went back and forth to China, which, which see, was uh, uh, a revelation to me because my father only went back once. But I found a lot of other people went back numerous times. All right, now this, in a way, is a, a better way of explaining what I wanted to do in the chart there. We have two families here, the Red Line family and the Blue Line family, okay? The Wongs and the Chows, or the Joes. Okay, so up in Holyoke, uh, Massachusetts, there were these three guys. They were brothers. They ran a laundry. And uh, interestingly, one of them had a son who was like hanging around the store. And one day, a white customer comes in and complains and, and files a protest and says, you know, you can't have children in a, in a working place. You know? So what happened on kind of that is, um, some white family that was pretty well to do and was friendly toward them sort of said, well, we'll be his foster parents. He can come live with us. Turned out to be a real kind of advantage for him in one sense because they were well healed. They sent him to prep school and eventually ends up going to MIT and getting a degree in civil engineering. I mean, how strange is that for a laundromat like in 1920 or something? So meanwhile, his uncles and his brother go down to Greenville 
and they open the Joe Gal they buy out the Joe Galview uh, store. And uh, some of them go back to China and get married, bring their wives over and so forth. Uh, now, meanwhile, over, over in Portland, there's another family, a Wong family. Guy comes over from China in 1870, and then he brings over a younger brother, and they open a herb store. And then, you know, as things happen, wherever opportunities happen, they decide, some of them decide to go to Fargo, North Dakota. And they open a restaurant, not a herb store. Somehow they're into restaurants, you know. And then they go bring another couple of brothers over, and they open restaurants. And then when the 30s come and the depression hits, restaurants fall into hard times. So the father sends the oldest son and I think the youngest son down to uh, Mississippi because they they have a, a one of the uh, one of his daughters down there because she's married to a Chinese in um, I believe Shelby, and he has a grocery store. So now they're starting to like you know move the family out of restaurants into sort of toy grocery stores. Um, actually, um, Paul Wong, who was just down here very recently, uh, he then, because he's a very young boy then, uh, actually goes to school uh, in Cleveland, uh, Mississippi, for a couple of years. And then they decide that uh, because the schools were not as good quality, they're going to make him go back, have him go back to Portland, where the schools were better. So he goes there. And then eventually, just to truncate this uh, thing, uh, Paul and, uh, oh, and then the red line, uh, the guy who goes over to China to build railroads, he has a family in China now. He has some daughters, and then the war starts to break out with Japan. So he decides he better get back over to the United States. So he brings all his children's daughters. One of his daughters is named Helen. So they go to Chula, Mississippi, an old store. Paul, meanwhile, has finished his degree. He comes back to Mississippi, and he meets Helen. In other words, uh, son, a grandson of the laundryman meets the... the the, uh, uh, of the restaurant owner meets the uh, granddaughter of the laundryman, and they meet in, in Mississippi and get married. Okay, so you have this little networks going on, a move this way, move that way, and there are a lot of stories like this, and it's really interesting to try to find out like why did they move, where did they move, and uh, it gets to be like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. But it sort of explains the uh, adaptability of these immigrants. They, they somehow learned where there were opportunities. And they were able to figure a lot of these things out in an amazing ways. Now, critical for the Chinese in the Delta was um, probably in the 1920s. Because prior to that, the, there were not a lot of Chinese children of school age. Because remember, a lot of the early Chinese came over as bachelors or left their families behind. But Sorry, somewhere around like the 20s, some of them uh, brought their wives over because you have to remember, as grocery people, they were considered merchants. So they didn't have exclusion against them as long as they could show they were merchants. So they were able to bring their wives over and their children started getting older and going to school. And uh, some, some, school, some communities had no problems with the Chinese going to the white school, uh, especially if there were just a few Chinese in those towns or if the father was well respected and, and knew the mayor or you know, knew the power people in the city. But if you grew up in a city where maybe some racist person was very powerful, they put down the law and say, you know, um, Mississippi Constitution says white schools are for Caucasians. Chinese are not Caucasians, so therefore they're not white. And so therefore they can't go to the white school. So this famous case, Gong Lung versus uh, I don't remember who it was versus, but in any case, uh, this case went to the Supreme Court of Mississippi. First, it was ruled favorably for the Chinese, but then it was appealed, and the state Supreme Court uh, rejected the Chinese uh, right to go to white school. It went to the U.S. Supreme Court, which upheld the Mississippi ruling, and so uh, the Chinese were not allowed to go to white schools. This was in uh, 1927, as I recall. So uh, what Mr. Lum did is, he just up and moved his family across the river over to Arkansas and where his children could go to a white school. Um, so this was a bad uh, kind of way, a low point for the Chinese in the Delta. But at the same time, there was, um, there was, it, it had some consequences that turned out favorably because uh, this opened the door for the Chinese to uh, form coalitions with like the Baptist Church who helped uh, 
fund uh, and provide uh, education like teachers, maybe in a limited level, like a you know, one-room schoolhouse in Greenville. Um, here's some pictures of the children in the schools. Um, so, the, for example, these are from Cleveland, uh, Mississippi. So the, the Chinese uh, Baptist Church, in coalition with uh, community leaders among the Chinese, um, were able to get a lot of the early Chinese immigrants to come to like uh, English classes, to um, religious uh, services, uh, you know, many held in Chinese and so forth. But prior to that, you know, it was like the missionaries wanted to get the Chinese to come to the churches, but the Chinese had no particularly need or urge to do this. And a lot of these missionaries had already been pretty thoroughly rebuffed in China. You know, they'd gone to China to try to, you know, Christianize Chinese, and they weren't too well received there. So they, you know, kicked them out, and they came back to the U.S. And so one day, one of these uh, missionaries says, you know, why are we knocking our heads off going to China? We got Chinese right here. Let's go and Christianize them. And so you can see there's a benefit for both sides. The, men, the white churches were fulfilling their mission, and then the Chinese were like getting to be a, a part of the larger community. They were by by becoming Christian instead of being perceived as Buddhist or Confucian or heathen or whatever, um, that probably made them more acceptable to the larger community. And then it sort of opened the doors for them to get a better education. So uh, even though it was limited, that school at Cleveland only lasted for, you know, it started in the late 30s and it lasted until maybe like, oh, 